confident, sure-footed and outspoken about what Africa needs and how she can help. I bring this, the skills to make sure they understand that the only way we can develop our continent is to just be normal and to be who we are and work very hard rather than just putting all this power behind it and hiding behind powers because it doesn't make any sense. Passionate about Africa's future. I want to thank you for your time and we're changing the world through technology. Thank you. This week on African Voices, information technology facilitator, social entrepreneur, blogger, mentor, a woman whose many roles make her hard to pin down. So let's talk about what you do. What, what, what do you do? <laughs> That's a very good question. The Senegalese-born, London-based and Africa-focused, Mariem Jam. From her offices, 57 floors up in the clouds, overlooking the city of London, Mariam Jam has based her business here, but looks to Africa, the continent of her birth, thousands of miles away. I'm based in London, I've got a company here called Spot One Global Solutions. So my company helps US companies uh, set a foothold in Europe, Middle East, Africa and Asia. So we, we work mainly with technology uh, companies, uh, software uh, vendors and editors. Uh, we also help investors, venture capitalists, go into Africa. We work with government. I sit in many, many advisory councils in Africa uh, on ICT uh, policies, so trying to implement them, bring good governance and transparency. Uh, I also blog. I'm an African blogger. I blog. I write about African affairs. Um, I kind of like protect Africa when people talk about, about the continent. I try to bring good narratives about Africa now because I see something different. Uh, in the continent. So uh, I also have a platform here uh, which I co-founded for one of my friends. So we bring um, Africans and people who cares about Africa to share ideas about Africa um, in, a, in a very, very good way. So we organize annual conferences here. Do you know um, how to start? Where do you need to look? Yeah. And I also mentor young Africans uh, that are wanted to get into the market in Africa and young, young uh, uh, Europeans who wanted to go into Africa, they work in international development, uh, they wanted to understand what's happening in the continent. So we're trying to shape the, the continent view now and how people see it. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. From the outside, looking in there? Yes, from outside. We're in London, well, and you based yourself in London, and yes. you made a decision to do that. Absolutely. Why? Because I, I feel more free here. I'm free in London. I can make decisions. I go to Africa uh, twice a month. So I'm, I'm very aware of what's happening in the continent. As I, I sit in this advisory board, I'm always called all the way from Mozambique to sit down uh, and to discuss ICT policies. So they're very important. I've got a big view on the continent. But I think as an African woman, as a Senegalese born, um, if I wanted to make an impact in my continent, I have to have a freedom to do that. I have to have a freedom to write. I've got to have to have a freedom to talk, to speak, to mention what's happening in my continent. So you say it's still difficult, particularly being a woman in Africa. You, you, f you feel there's still barriers to you actually working successfully there. Absolutely. There's a barrier. You know, there's absolutely a big barrier there for me. As a, as a young woman going to Africa, meeting all these IT directors, meeting all these ministers, sitting down in room, they don't take you seriously. Uh, they don't take you, uh, they don't take anything you say into consideration because it's, we have still the system where men are too powerful in, in Africa. So I see this all the time uh, when I go there. So, but you know, as being coming from London, it does uh, you know, make sure that people understand. Uh, when I came in, uh, yeah, I'll just tell you a very quick story. I was in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire uh, when I had 250 IT directors in a room. And um, because my name, Mariam Jam, is very, is very European, it's very different. So uh, I was in my room preparing myself to come in and run a workshop. And um, so they, they came in, and the, the guy who was announcing people coming in said, uh, we have Mariam Jam in the room. Uh, she's going to be coming here. And uh, it was amazing because it was like all these guys were waiting probably for a blonde, um, you know, from London coming. <laughs> so they came in and they, they saw me coming in, you know, a young lady, you know, walking in the, on the stairs coming to see them. And they all turned their head back all the way to see me. And it was like, you could see, ooh, they were shocked. And I said, wow, you know. So uh, you can see that they, they, they still have all this perspective waiting, you know, to wait for someone different to come and do that. So they don't see women being powerful like myself very, very quickly in Africa. So it's hard sometimes. Tell me about you know, where you came from and what defined you. Was it education? 
I think it's education. Um, my father was very rigorous as a as a as a father, and my mom was educated. So I come in a middle class of uh, of Senegalese people. Um, so yeah, education was very very important. But I was <coughs> I was a lost girl when I was in Senegal because I was very hungry to to understand what was going on behind uh, behind doors, and that was uh, that pushed me to work very very hard uh, to make sure that. You know, I don't lose my identity um, as a Senegalese person, and also I don't get privileged like many, many Senegalese people, as like me, get sometime when you are part of this aristocrat system in Senegal. So I had to go all the way to France to find my way, and that was in 1992 when my dad died. So you went to France. Yeah. Why was that so important? I went to France. I had to go to France because my dad died in 1992. And I was probably, I was 17, 16, 17. It was very, very hard for me. My, my mom come from an aristocrat family in Senegal. So we, they, we, we got classes in Senegal. So when she comes from a very, very well-founded family, uh, her father uh, was one of the first, uh, you know, colonial, uh, black Africans to go to France. So the president of Senegal, Abdullah Wad, was my, fa my grandfather people. He was in his, in his school. So my, my, fa my mom made, the, their family made a very big name in Senegal. So it's very, it was very difficult for me to find an identity within that circle. Surely that should protect you in a way, give you a, a, a step up in Absolutely, a way. absolutely. But it, it's very difficult because then, then corruption comes uh, in that and then you don't have an identity. So I was very eager to go and find my own identity. So I went to France and did cleaning jobs, uh, worked in restaurants, uh, did many, many small jobs to pay for my studies. And uh, I just wanted to finish my studies. I, wanted, I was very interested in technology, and that's what I wanted to do. So uh, that's where I am. So I, I fought all the way to be where I am today. Were you a bit of a rebel? Yes, I was. <laughs> my family thinks I was a rebel. I, I'm, I'm a rebel. Yes, I am a rebel. Because I had to, I also had to um, completely dismiss my identity. I had to refuse my status as an aristocrat to be just a normal person, because I didn't believe in that. Uh, for, for my mum, you know, becoming an aristocrat or being, having a big name or big blood in Senegal is very important. And for me, it wasn't very important because she had everything she wanted. She was access to big people. But um, I wanted to just be myself. And being herself meant becoming part of the great migration, dealing with the challenges of living in the diaspora. Senegalese native Mariam Jam, living far away from home, is not always easy. She has achieved business success as an IT facilitator, running a company called Spot One Global Solutions, which encourages global investment in African IT infrastructure. This success, though, has come at a cost. She finds it necessary to make her home a continent away in England. I just want to understand a little bit more about the power of the diaspora, mm -hmm. the African diaspora, particularly educated, young, powerful, connected, smart people mm. who choose to live outside of the continent, yeah. but at the same time still very much connected. Yes. Um, you're not the only one. There are lots of you. Absolutely. We are, it's a lot of us. It's a lot of us out there. Uh, we, I think the biggest problem we have is that we don't have visibility. All these people out there who are powerful, Got, have got their MBAs, their PhDs, really studied, had something from the West, um, you know, as part of the, the British colonies, for example, or the French colonies uh, in Senegal, Mali, Bamako, everywhere you go, Mozambique from Portugal. They all studied from Sweden. They have power in their, in, in their hand. But what they don't have is visibility. Uh, they don't have credibility sometimes, and people don't take them seriously. So they can't be profitable in the market. So there's a big, there's, there's a deficit of trust in the continent. So as Africans, if we don't trust each other, nobody trusts us. So this is a big problem. I always try to talk about when I go there. So you see the powerful people like us, you know, sitting in London. You know, we, we are still a lost, we're still lost, we're still a lost generation trying to find our ways because People don't understand what we, in our continent, in Senegal, for example, people wouldn't understand, or in Mali, they wouldn't understand. They expect you to be like them when you go there. When he lived here in a lonely, cold London for many, many years, you know, in the snow, going and trying to fight your ways, paying your bills, 
working very, very hard. It's very tough. So you become tough like that. Mentally, you become very, very tough and you can't be influenced And you by don't anyone. really belong in either place. You don't belong anywhere. So it's a loss. You, we, we completely lost. So that's why it's very important right now, as we have all this intellect, this power, we need to start going back and giving to our people. The power and the, the richness is not just the intellect, but it's money as well. I it mean, the money. African diaspora sometimes supports entire countries Absolutely. in terms of the money they send home. Absolutely. Think about Somalia, Zimbabwe. I mean, I think... A lot of people back home survive not just on remittances. The, 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 the remittances. And I know that we've done a lot of stories on it, but it's sometimes astounding the connections on all sorts of levels people have with, with, with back home. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's a very good point. And that's what I was saying uh, to the, some guys the other day. I said, the time is time for us to create our own, uh, our own funds, our own investment funds. But again, there's a t trust deficit. You can't ask a Seneg as, as somebody from Senegal in Paris. You can't ask me right now to invest in Senegal because I don't trust anyone in Senegal. I can't give my money to anybody in Senegal. So that's why it's very important for us to start sharing as Africans, start trusting each other, start creating a platform where we can all have discussions, chat. And, and, and through that, you, then we start trusting each other. And, and if you don't have any visibility, a guy from Tanzania who's got a lot of money doesn't have any visibility, how would you know what, when that person get the money from? So people don't know where I am. So they, they wouldn't know where I come from. So that's why there's a deficit of trust. I think we should really start reshaping the way we talk to one another, the way we deal with one another as Africans, because we've been divided from day one. And uh, this is very important for us right now in the continent otherwise what's going to happen you get new generation of uh, of people from the west going to africa creating these funds from all the way from los angeles uh silicon valley going to to nairobi going to to senegal going to other countries creating these funds uh for for us in africa as we have the money in uh, africans we should start doing this but again if we don't trust each other it's very very difficult for us to get into this and you say that you went to Paris, you now live in London, and you choose to live in London, that in a way, London is easier for a black African woman than Paris. Why is that? Give me some sense of the, the stereotypes, the challenges you would face in a place like Paris, for example. France is very tough. France is a very, very tough country to live in and to do anything, really. Uh, you know, we've been colonized by France, 17 countries in Africa, West Africa, Mali, Senegal, Bamako, all these countries been colonized by France. So when you see now, there's, there's, there's lots of Senegalese people living in France. So the community is actually broken, it's fragmented in, in, in France. So, you know, the, the, the French people don't understand because Sen Af Senegal, for example, my country is a heaven of projects, NGOs. Eight going to going to Senegal. Many many people go in there. It's a hot country. People like going on holiday. So there is this sense of uh, needy people of hang out, uh, hand out being given to Senegal quite a lot. So when then the French people see us in France, in Paris, it's very difficult for you to they take you seriously. Algerians have got the same problem in Paris. So French people don't take African and foreigners very very seriously. But when it comes to Britain, it's different. So it just took me a year to start to come to London. That's what that way it took me. On Thursday, I had a job. In France, I was looking for a job for many, many years. I couldn't find a job. When I gave my CV to a lady there, she put it in the bin, asking me to go and do a babysitting job. So when I came to the UK, I was respected. As long as you pay your taxes in this country, you understand, you've, you have an experience, they give an opportunity, no matter where you come from. That's why I like about Britain. And I think sometimes we take it for granted. And um, I just can't thank this country enough to give, give an opportunity. For me to become a CEO on this, in this country, sitting down in my office in Canada Roof, is very rare. I could never do this in France. Is it something very deep within French society? I remember many years ago covering French riots in the Banlieues. I mean, it, it, is it still very racist there? Is that what you're suggesting? It is. The French, the France is a very racist country. Uh, and today, if you go to suburb in, in Paris, there's no difference between uh, Dakar, Mali, to the suburb in, uh, you know, in, in Delhi, in France. It's the same. Saint Denis, you go to Saint Denis, it's the same. The only difference is the weather. The only difference between those suburbs and Senegal or Mali or Burkina Faso is just the weather. But they're still crowded. They still live in, in difficult conditions. People don't listen to them. They're very angry. One way to improve lives and bring people together is with technology, Mariam Jam praises the power of internet connectivity, but advises caution. I think our biggest issue right now is to make sure youth get education. They, they get educated, they get jobs, we create jobs, and they, they will be a, we will have a problem if you don't if you not careful. So we organize conferences also for tech companies 
in Africa. Expatriate businesswoman Mariam Jam helps global technology companies recognize Africa's potential. And people can see what they do as well, so it's both ways. And facilitates international partnerships that benefit both business and society. The concept of the revolution that has literally been sparked by connectivity about internet and mobile phones, particularly in Africa. It's hard to explain, unless you're walking in Africa, the impact it's made on ordinary people's lives. Absolutely. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, it you see amazing. it, I see it, but it's mind blowing. It's a game changer. It is. It is mind blowing. It's, uh, it's amazing when you go all the way to Kaulak, my village, where you see women having mobile, mobile phones. Everybody's using mobile phones. But I think we need to be very cautious now because now they've got these mobile phones. What are they going to do about it? What are they going to do with this mobile phone? People are still uneducated in Africa. Women are still uneducated. So I, I meet women in, in Kaulak uh, where they, don't have, they have no education. They can't even read the alphabet. So, but they do have mobile phones to access uh, to access to their people. So I think now, you know, we need to really be cautious on how mobile phone is, is affecting the continent right now and really make sure we, we scrutinize all this, you know, big organization going to Africa. And we need to be careful in Africa because Africa now is, is a destination for investment. People are interested in the continent. You know, the first time I see my inbox more 10 years ago when I used to talk about Africa, nobody cares about it. But now everybody wants to get into the continent because it's booming. It's very tough in Europe. And I think a lot of, you know, when people think of technology, they think of young people. Yes. It's sort of the spark, the creativity of youth. Now, the youth bulge in Africa, a billion young people. I mean, the numbers are extraordinary, but it, it is both a curse and, and a, a, a gift in a way. Mm. How, how do you ensure in 20 years' time that this wave of, of young people uses technology and uses it well? to uplift themselves, for example. That, that's, um, <coughs> technology is, is, we have technology in Africa. We have technology in Africa. As soon as we sort out the fiber optic, all the internet connectivity in Africa, you'll see something very different. Yes. But I think our biggest issue right now is to make sure youth get the youth get education. They, they get educated, they get jobs, we create jobs. And they, they will be, a, we will have a problem if you don't, if you know, careful, as Kofi Annan said in Addis Abeba, we'll have a difficult, we have a, you know, equality problem in Africa, where you see the middle class now of, uh, of you know, the Africa growing very, very fast, uh, you know, and you see the youth are is very stagnant right and now. And left behind. And left behind. So we need to make sure there's a, there's a, there's a you know, there's a way of, of, of building, uh, having infrastructures in Africa, making sure the youth are getting educated. What is the biggest trend? I mean, when you look you stand back now, you obviously, you're the bridge between US companies trying to, and, and, and others trying to get into Africa, for example. What are the fundamental things that you tell people? What's gonna, what is really gonna change things? What, I need to, what is gonna change is localize. We need to localize the products. People know what they want in Africa. So you can't come now and impose your solutions in the continent. So make sure that you localize your product. You speak to African people when you're on the ground. Talk to big marketing companies in Africa, ask questions, do, your, do some research. We don't do research in Africa. I think we have a big issue right now for, for US companies, I'll tell them all the time, before you get into Africa, do your research, speak to the African people, don't just come and impose your solutions uh, to the continent. All the way from South Africa, they do this. So um, I think we need to start having a proper debate about uh, the Africa, how African people consuming uh, products. The only way we can develop the continent is to start uh, trade in the continent, look into the startup, uh, small businesses, branding companies, uh, manufacturing companies setting up, uh, skills that are being transfer transferred from the West to Africa. We need to, we need to start investing into these this organizations. African people need to get more funding into the tech sector. The tech sector is booming right now and many, many sectors across the continent. So, but research is very, very important for any organization, even into the tech industry. Uh, you know, just don't just go with the buzz or there's the next mobile phone happening in Nairobi or in Mombasa or whatever. Uh, just make sure that you do your research before you get into the continent and talk to the African people before you get in there. You talk a lot about talking and about perhaps sharing and mentoring. You, you seem, you're a mom. Yes, sir. Does that play a lot into it? You're very, very keen on actually sort of trying to bring more Africans into your fold in a way. Yeah, I think, I think as I go to the, I, as I go to Africa, I see difficulties. I see people who have got difficulties. Difficulties of, um, they see people from the West coming for one week or five days, speaking to them in a corner of a room and then and just leave. 
And then what's happened, th there's, there's a problem of attachment there because the person will just say, okay, well, you just came in for a couple of days to do your project and then you leave it. What's going to happen to me when I leave? And this is a big issue. So, but you have, you know, I, I get a queue of people saying, Mariam, I need you to help me. I need you to help me with my business. I need to help me for marketing, my business development. So then we decided, I said, okay, but rather than just helping them for one or two days when I'm in, in Accra, in my hotel, then I'm going to start doing that online now. I'm going to start doing that online. So I've been doing it for the last five years where I mentor young Africans, uh, doing setting up their businesses, making them understand what they need to do, but also having setting up some strategy uh, of what they really want to go in their life. Because sometimes you can't ask your parents in Africa. It's very difficult. So I go into the mentoring process with them, really shaping them personally and set, setting up their businesses. And do you have an idea of when you want to launch this brand, for example, in Accra? What do you think is gaining Not only online, but face-to-face -to -face too. Mariam finds great satisfaction in being able to help her continent by teaching young Africans like these how to strategize and sell their ideas. Simply, ably, and with total confidence. For everyone. So for women, for men... I think I'm very proud. I've got an identity as an African woman, and I think my voice being listened around the world and for what we do, the very simple thing we do um, is changing the continent. I think now we're influencing government in Africa. We, we, we're working with uh, many organizations to reshape the narratives about Africa. Uh, I bring technology companies in the, in the continent. So there's an identity there right now. So uh, we're trying to keep that up. Uh, but yeah, we, we're very proud in, in, in what we do in Africa.